friend, I know that you are busy. Your life is full. Your schedule is full. Your house is probably full. And what we're going to talk about today is not really about how to change the busyness or get rid of some of the clutter in our life. We're going to talk about a foundational element of our lives. And when we are busy, it gets really easy to forget about it, to rush past it, to take it for granted. We're going to talk today about practical steps for how we can understand the Bible. We can actually apply the Bible to our real life, to our family life, to how we are raising our kids and talking to our husbands and planning our busy schedules. And we're going to talk about how is it that you, as the mom, as a spiritual leader in your home, can shape your family's spiritual growth. Because if you are a follower of Christ, I know that one of your top priorities is that your children will become followers of Christ and that your family and your marriage will reflect the goodness of God. And all of that only happens if we are intentional about how we use our time and specifically about how we invite the Lord into our time, our schedule, our home, and let him shape who we are and how we lead and love our people. So that is what we're talking about today. I know that you're busy (laughs) and I know that spending time in God's word can sometimes be really rushed. Um, I mean, different seasons look different for all of us, but when we're in mom season (laughs) from the day they're born to the day they graduate and they move out on their own, we're busy. We don't necessarily have an hour every day to sit down and pour over the word and dive into prayer. Sometimes we're lucky if we have five minutes to open the Bible and spend time with God. And we want to make sure that we are able to use those five minutes well and to try to get creative with how to invite God in and actually understand who he is, what he's doing, and let him shape our lives, but also our family's life. So if you want to grow spiritually yourself, if you want spiritual growth, if you want family discipleship, you need to know God's word and you need to be able to apply it. So my friends, that is what we are talking about today. And I am excited for this topic. We have several resources for you if you want to go deeper. There's a free resource um, at loveyourpeoplewell.com. It's the Holy Habits 45 Day Bible and Prayer Challenge. If I mention knowing the Bible, understanding it, applying it to real life, and you're thinking, whoa, that is way beyond where I am at today, then you're going to want to get started with the holy habits, with a very practical, real life, 45-day guide to diving into scripture and praying. And then we also have a line of devotionals. Several of them are 40-day devotionals diving into some deep topics around family life, and others are um, what I would call a devotional workbook, kind of thinking through the scriptures in a, in a different way and looking at how do they apply to my life, my identity in Christ, resting on God's promises. So we have a number of resources if you do want to go deeper. But the first step is finding that time And using that time well, feeling like you're actually getting something from your time with the Lord. So my friends, let's dive in. Welcome to the Love Your People Well podcast, where we help women grow godly relationships, grateful hearts, and grace-filled lives. I'm Jess, and I'm a marriage and family therapist, a Christian, a wife, a mom, and I believe that God creates us for relationships relationship with him and with each other. So if you're looking to love God well, to love yourself, your family, and those around you well, you're in the right place. Stick around, friend, and let's get started. All right, as we dive in today, let me just remind you that you can always find the full show notes for today's episode on the website. Today is episode 72, and so you would just visit loveyourpeoplewell.com forward slash zero seven. Two, and you will see um, everything we're going to talk about today in more of like a blog format, if you're more of a reader than a listener. And you'll find links to other episodes that hit on similar topics. You'll find links to other resources, 
that is going to be um, a great spot to go if you want to dive a little bit deeper into today's topic. That's loveyourpeoplewell.com forward slash 072. And where we're going today, we are going to outline five steps that we, I'm not going to say can take, but that we should take, that we must take if we really want to know God's word and know how to apply it to our lives to let him lead our family life. We have five steps we're going to talk through there. And then we're going to dig a little more deeply into kind of the application piece. Sometimes we want to jump there. And it is a part of the process, but we don't want to just skip over uh, probably the more important pieces before we start applying. But we will close out today with an additional five steps around some action steps we can take in our busy lives to actually apply what we are learning from God's word. Not time-consuming action steps, not not difficult action steps, but they might be ones that take a little bit of practice to make them feel like a normal part of life. So just if you, you know, some people really like to have that overview, where are we going? What's our outline? That's our outline, my friend. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I will kick us off with my usual disclaimer. I am a licensed therapist, but this podcast and all the resources from Love Your People Well are not professional or personal advice. This is not therapy. So if you are thinking about counseling, I do have several episodes devoted to that. And you can find all that information at loveyourpeoplewell.com forward slash counseling. That'll have um, a lot more for you if you're thinking about counseling, how to get connected with a great counselor, how to make sure Christ is at the center of your mental health and everything that's going on. So all of that can be found on the website. There's a link in the um, episode description, whatever app you're using. And of course, you can hop online whenever you want. So with that in mind, my friends, let's dive into these five action steps for how we can really know God's word, whether we have a full hour to be reading the Bible, or we have five minutes, or we're listening to it while we're washing the dishes and trying to keep the kids under control. (laughs) No matter how much time we have, we can grow spiritually and learn God's word and apply God's word because he is always speaking and he is always faithful. His word never returns void. So here are some action steps, five action steps that will help us know God's word. It is really helpful that we start our time in the Bible with prayer and specifically praying for the Lord to open our eyes to what he is saying, to give us wisdom, to understand what he is saying. Now, again, this could be a long drawn out prayer, especially if life is really crazy. Maybe you're dealing with a lot of anxiety or stress and it's hard to focus. The prayer part of reading the Bible can be a really important place to start. But of course, this could be as simple as pulling out the Bible and closing your eyes for four and a half seconds to say, Lord, please speak to me today. Lord, please open my ears today. Whatever short little phrase can help you actually engage in the moment to come where you're able to open God's word and dive in. And that's step number one is to pray, to not just haphazardly open your Bible and start reading, but to purposefully invite the Lord into that moment. We know that he's going to speak because that's what he does. And the Bible is his word. So we know that he's there. We know that he's speaking. We don't always know that we are listening, that we are receptive and open to whatever it is that he wants to share. And so asking him to fill us with his wisdom and understanding and knowledge of his will, that is a great place to start any Bible time, whether it's long or short, individual or family time, whatever it looks like. And then, of course, action step number two is to read God's word. And this is different, my friend, than reading a devotional about God's word or reading an amazing book about theology. It is most important to actually open the Bible or open your your app where it will read to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be sitting down and reading. There are plenty of audio Bibles out there, websites, apps, all sorts of things. But get into God's word. 
you want to go to church, you want to hear sermons, it's great to read good, healthy theological books, but none of that is a replacement for actually spending time listening to God yourself. And we know from scripture that he is always speaking. One of the most famous passages in the New Testament comes from Hebrews chapter 4, which tells us the word of God is alive and active. It is sharp. It penetrates us. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. And absolutely nothing is hidden from God's sight. And if you want a thriving family life, if you want to disciple your kids, if you want to be growing, you can't do that without something that is alive and something that is active. And I know from, oh gosh, from personal experience and from so many conversations with other people, we all know that sometimes reading the Bible feels really dry. I cannot read Leviticus and like numbers in the Old Testament where they have these just lists of all the different Israelites and the different tribes. I personally, I really struggle to read that and feel like this is alive and this is active and this is penetrating me and this is changing my life. But it is somehow, some way God uses every single word in the Bible. He breathes his life into it and he can use it and he will use it to make a difference. So whether you're following some plan, you know, every day you're checking off the box, even though it doesn't maybe feel like the most meaningful Bible passage of the, of your life, or you're just opening it and reading whatever Psalm you happen to land in, or you're following some other plan, whatever it takes, you can trust if you are spending time in God's word, he is speaking and he is acting. This is not some old dusty book that has shaped all of human history. I mean, it is, it has shaped all of human history and it's still applicable today. In our modern world with our busy schedules and our crazy lives, God's word is still alive and active. So we start with prayer and then we actually do for ourselves, dive into God's word. And this is where point number three that I would remind you of is to make sure you're not simply reading one verse That's kind of a popular thing, like the verse of the day, or you go on Instagram and you see like one or two verses highlighted and it's so pretty and it has flowers and it's the right colors and it looks so great. But we really need to read God's word with the context of what is going on. And of course, this will get easier the more time that you spend in the Bible. But if you were to just, for example, to grab that free copy I mentioned of our Holy Habits 45-day Bible and prayer challenge, those Bible passages are are purposefully long. It's like read this entire chapter, sometimes maybe even two entire chapters or this big chunk of text because that's the only way you can actually get the context of what is going on. And I think this gets particularly difficult, or not difficult, uh, but less common when we jump into the New Testament because there are so many single verses or like tiny little passages that are hugely powerful, even though they are short. And that feels more manageable for us. It feels like something I could actually memorize. I could actually write that down on my family's whiteboard. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if you're writing it down and not aware of and maybe talking to your kids about the context, why is that verse so important? How does it connect with the rest of God's story, with the rest of scripture, you're really going to miss that understanding piece of what is going on for God, of who he is and how everything is connected. So if we just take, for example, I've already mentioned Hebrews chapter four has um, this famous verse. Well, it's really two verses about, you know, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Let's just stop there. That's one verse, verse 12 in chapter four of Hebrews. And that's powerful. And that is true. And we could memorize that. We could be challenged by that. We could um, turn back to that scripture every time we open God's word. But we will only get the most power from that verse, the most understanding of who God is by reading it in context. What else is happening 
in Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to guess you can't tell me without opening your Bible. And that's fine. I couldn't tell you except that I opened my Bible before I started this podcast so that we could look at this together. And if we look at all of chapter 4, we see that the author is talking here about Sabbath and about rest, about how God's people have been promised that they will enter into God's rest. But if we are not seeking after God, if we are not letting God shape us and lead us, then we may, as it says in verse one, we may have been found to have fallen short of it. If we are not actually engaging with our faith and living out our faith, then we are at, we're not really going to experience the rest that God has planned for us. And so this chapter talks about how it is that God has shared his good news with his people, the message he has given them, and the reality that some of his people have have failed to really embrace that faith and live out that faith. And it continues on talking about his creation of the world and kind of a little bit of his story, how that then moved to the Israelites and the promised land. And it talks about how it still remains for some people to enter that rest, that God is still working, is still calling people to himself, is still promising rest for his people. And from there, as it has talked about how God speaks to us and how he wants us to respond, it is in that context that we see verse 12, for the word of God is alive and active. And after this very famous, very popular verse about the word of God, it continues on then to talk about Jesus as the great high priest, which of course was an incredibly important role in the Old Testament for the old covenant that God had with his people. And so it moves forward then in Hebrews talking about why it matters that Jesus is the great high priest. What is his role? The fact that he can empathize with us, connect with us. He is currently in heaven with God, alive and active, just like God's word here on earth with us today. And so when we think about our goal, that even though we're super busy, we will be able to connect with God, understand his word, and apply it to our lives, apply it to our family's life, we know that we have to not simply pull out a verse here and there, it sounds good, makes me feel good, I can memorize it, whatever. We need to actually look at the full context because it is a different, it's going to connect with us differently to read this passage that says, for the word of God is alive and active, and to consider that in the context of God reminding us, I have been speaking since the creation of the world. I continued to speak through the prophets to my people. I led them into the promised land. I continued to speak by sending my son as the great high priest. I continue to speak today. He has ascended into heaven. And of course, it's talking about all these amazing things about Jesus. But we see our Bible in this bigger context of God speaking to his people. Now, does that, does that change the reality that the word of God is alive and active? No, but it deepens that meaning and that understanding. And that is what we're talking about today. So if you're looking for some good talking points or like that quote that you want to give your kid when you're talking about obedience, that's fine. That's one way to read the Bible, but you're not going to grow in the same way and you're not going to understand the full picture of scripture if you're just picking and choosing certain parts of the Bible to read. Maybe they feel more comfortable, maybe they sound more powerful or they're easier to remember, but it's most meaningful to start at the beginning and go to the end. And I don't necessarily mean Genesis to Revelation, whatever book you're reading, whatever chapter you're reading in scripture, start at the beginning and read to the end. Read until it kind of starts onto a new topic or a new chapter or a new book. And that will help you better understand the full picture of who God is, what he's saying, and what he wants us to do. And that was a deep dive into point number three. So we want to pray, we want to actually read God's word, we want to read it in context. But I do want to say one more thing about context, because I know I've mentioned already a few times, you're busy. I know you're busy. I'm busy. 
(laughs) And this is where, again, we want to do this, read the context, read from start to finish in the fullness of life. This might not be realistic every single time you sit down to read God's word. And there is a big argument to be made for if, especially if that's the case, I don't have time to read it from start to finish, to read the whole book of Hebrews in one setting, or even the whole chapter, chapter four. Well, read one paragraph and maybe read that paragraph several times, either that same day or every day this week. I'm going to read the same paragraph because God is still talking. He's still teaching me and I'm going to remember it a lot better at the end of the week to move on to paragraph number two (laughs) or whatever it is that actually is realistic for you in the busyness of life, but still gives you that bigger picture of scripture. So don't feel pressured that, you know, it's only worth spending time in God's word if I have time to read the full book or the full chapter. If you only have time for a paragraph or for a few verses, that's fine. Um, Just don't rush through that. And if that is where you're at in your busy season of life, read that verse or those two verses or those five verses. And then the next day, maybe you want to reread them or read the next three or five verses. You don't just want to be hopping. Okay, today was Hebrews, but I think tomorrow I'm going to jump to Genesis. And maybe by the end of the week, I'll read a few things in Revelation. If you're not connecting dots, it's going to start to get really frustrating and you're going to start to feel like you don't understand what's going on. And that's frustrating and that's not necessary. But let's move on to number four. Action step number four is we need to meditate on what we've read. Now, yes, this might mean I'm sitting down for a half hour and reflecting on it or rereading it or journaling through what God was saying. That might be possible. But it also might mean I write it on a note card and I stick it on the bathroom mirror so that I can reread it 12 times today because that's how I'm going to keep it fresh in my mind without spending a ton of time. So I'm saying don't rush through reading God's word, but I don't necessarily mean that actual chunk of time that you're sitting down and reading the Bible. We can continue to meditate on God's word throughout the day. Um, Maybe that's a certain verse that really jumps out at you. Maybe that's a word from what you've read that you write down and you're thinking about and praying about and wrestling with. Maybe that's a certain prayer that you just keep coming back to throughout the day. But it is really important if we really have the goal, I want to actually understand God's word and apply it, then we can't just spend five minutes or even 50 minutes reading it and then we close the book and we move on with the rest of our day like nothing is different. We need to actually let God's word rest in us. We need to wrestle with it. We need to take time to really let it sink into our soul. And then action step number five, how to read the Bible, how to get the most out of the Bible is to ask questions while you're reading the Bible, to seek to actually understand not just what do the words say and could I repeat them back to you, but to try to understand it in a deeper way, to acknowledge your questions and to talk about them to God, and then possibly, if needed, to seek out answers from a sermon or from talking to your pastor or from a book. This is the place where adding in those outside resources might be really helpful because they help us clarify or deepen our understanding after we have already read God's word ourselves. And one of the most popular ways to do this is called an inductive Bible study. And you will find different language for the three steps of an inductive Bible study. But it basically boils down to, as you read the passage, you're trying to observe, interpret, and apply. So you're observing, what does this text say? It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It's actually trying to understand what do these words mean? How do they fit together? at just a most plain and basic reading, what is God saying? But then we also want to try to interpret it, to put ourselves in the place of the original readers who undoubtedly use swords more than we use swords and who had a different perspective about how swords were used in everyday life. I mean, this is obviously just an example from Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, but trying to consider 
what did these words or these parables or these stories mean to the original people who were hearing it? Because it, it, it's still alive and active for us, but it's never going to mean something totally different than what it meant originally to those original readers and hearers. And so trying to not only understand what does it say, but why does that matter? How would that connect with people? How do we understand this in the bigger context of life? And then finally, um, in, in an inductive Bible study, there's that third step of application. Whatever the passage is, there's always something God wants us to do based on what we have heard. So if we take Hebrews 4, <laughs> verse 12, that we've been talking about, for the word of God is alive and active, and then it says it's sharper, it penetrates, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Okay, there's not an application here like, Jessica, you need to go out and give away half of your belongings. You need to go out and share the gospel with this specific person. But there is an application here. There's, I mean, for starters, there's an application that I need to read God's word, that I need to let God's word penetrate even to dividing my soul and my spirit. I need to let God's word judge the thoughts and attitudes of my heart. That is a clear application from this one verse. And I can understand that application better if I know the context that it is in. But then there's the action step. What am, am I actually going to do it? I've read it. I understand it. I have some context around it. But am I actually going to take action on what God is telling me to do? And that is a very fair and appropriate application of this verse. But you know what, friend? There are other applications. I could also read this one verse, this section of scripture, and walk away feeling very much led by the Spirit to praise God and worship God because his word is alive and active and to celebrate that and to spend time in worship and praising him and praising him for his word, praising him for his holy judgment, praising him for his power and his insight. That's a different application, but it is equally valid. It is equally important. It is equally powerful. And I could, maybe just as a third example of application, again, from this one verse, it's very reasonable that I might walk away from this time in the word with the application that I need to share God's word with other people. And maybe specific people come to mind because the Holy Spirit is telling me, hey, Jessica, that neighbor who you're going to have dinner with next week, hmm, that might be a good chance to share the word of God because it is alive and active. And you might have a great conversation, but if it does not penetrate to dividing soul and spirit, it's not a conversation that's as powerful as God's word. And it's not my place to judge my neighbor's thoughts and attitudes, but it is the place of my holy God and of his word. And so even from this one reading, we can see different applications, which the Lord reveals to us as we seek his his personal application, his Holy Spirit to speak into our individual lives. And so again, much as we started with prayer, we want to conclude our time with prayer. We want to ask God, what do you want me, me personally, me, Jessica Hayes sitting here recording this podcast, me, busy mom listening to this podcast, what is it, God, that you want me to take away from this passage of scripture. And he's never going to want you to take something away that's not true to his word or to his character, but he very well likely is going to apply it in ways that are unique to you. How do I apply the word of God to my family with toddlers is going to be different than how you apply the word of God to your family with teenagers or as an empty nester or as a single woman. It's the same word, it's still alive, it's still active, but we're going to apply it and live it out in some slightly different, more personalized ways. So let's recap these five steps for reading the Bible and understanding the Bible, and then we will hit on five pieces as far as application that can help us, even when life is busy, to really start living this out with our family. First, we want to pray 
then we want to read his word for ourselves, not through the lens of another sermon or another book. We want to open his word and read it. And we want to read it in context, trying to gain over time an understanding of the fullness of scripture. Number four, we want to meditate on what we've read. We don't want to rush through. We want to let it really sit with us over the course of the day, the week, really over the course of our whole lives. And number five, we want to ask questions and really seek to understand what it is we're reading. And one great way to do that is an inductive Bible study, but just generally speaking, ask questions. Think about, whoa, this was really weird. What did this mean to the original readers? What on earth is going on here? God, what do you want me to take away from this? We want to engage with God as we read his word. So some five ideas for how to then apply this to your family, to let God's word as it fills you, as you understand it better, how to then take that and actually love other people well, <laughs> love your family, let it lead your family's spiritual life. And the first idea here is to talk about what you're learning with your husband. You and your husband are the leaders of your family. You're that kind of adult uh, unit, the parental unit. And you don't need to be learning the same thing all the time, but you need to be aware of what God is saying to each of you. You might want to study together, or you might just want to talk about, I read this today. This is the application I heard from God. Like, help me do this. I'm excited to do this. You know, whatever it might be, but talk about it with your husband. Make it a part of your marital dialogue. You also, number two, you want to take those questions that you had and bring them to other people in your life. So that might be seeking answers, or it might be you have found answers. And now again, you can have conversations with people. You can try to educate people. You can show them what God is teaching you. You can do it with your husband, with your pastor, with your friends, with your kids. But to take this out of just your personal special Bible time into your conversations and your relationships to let them know, I was wrestling with this. I didn't understand this. I'm working on memorizing this. Let them see how God is shaping you through the time that you're spending in his word. Number three, thinking about questions, it's a great opportunity to also ask people questions, especially your kids, about whatever it is that you've been reading. You've been thinking about it. You've been meditating on it. You've been wrestling with it. Ask them questions and try to expand their understanding of God's word, their own meditation on and wrestling with God's word. Ask people questions and invite them into that conversation. Number four, pray with other people. Pray about what you're reading, what you're learning, what you're confused about. Pray about what other people are learning and hearing. It's really helpful to not just think about it and talk about it, but to pray, to continue that conversation with God. And then number five, in the busyness of life, you're going to have conversations. You're going to pray. You're going to ask questions. You might as well link them back to the Bible, at least sometimes. But number five is to actually read the Bible with your husband, your kids, your family. And this is a great activity over breakfast or dinner, um, especially if you have a goal around sharing those times together. And sometimes we don't know what to talk about or there's arguing or there's bickering. Just open the Bible, read a psalm, read a paragraph, read through a chapter or a book together over time. You can not only follow the same five steps we talked about with your whole family, but you can let God speak for himself. And if they don't want, you know, if that's not how you want to spend your dinner, that's not maybe the best time for you. It might be an extra time that your family does each week. It might be a once a week special occasion. It might be that in the evenings while everyone's kind of resting and doing their own thing, you are doing your quiet time, but you're reading out loud. I mean, there's a number of ways that this could look. But these are just some ideas for how to take what you are learning personally and expand it. Apply it to to your mom life, <laughs> to the, your leadership in your family, to your relationships. Talk about it. Share your questions with people. Ask them questions. Pray with people and read God's word with people, not just by yourself. So I hope, my friend, that some of these thoughts have been helpful. Um, again, we have a lot of resources 
uh, the Love Your People Well website has a ton, but I'm going to highlight the free Holy Habits 45-Day Bible and Prayer Challenge, as well as our line of devotionals. If there are certain topics that you want to dive into or that you're struggling with, or if you just want to get more more of a habit, more of a routine going of spending time in God's word, those are going to be some great resources for you. And the link will be in your episode description in whatever app you're in. But of course, you can always go to the website for the full show notes, loveyourpeoplewell.com forward slash 072. And that is all I've got for you today, my friend. We are going to be back on Friday with our Friday Faith Follow-Up to talk about a specific prayer method. Um, that you can use personally and that you can use to teach your kids how to pray. So that will be really helpful. Definitely circle back with us on Friday. But until then, my friend, hugs and blessings to you. I'll talk to you soon. Hey friend, before you go, if this episode was helpful or encouraging for you, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a written review. It not only encourages me, it helps other women connect with this community. And you know what else? You have a chance right now to love your friends well. Copy the link to this episode and send it in a text to someone who you know needs to hear today's conversation. Or just take a screenshot, post it in your Instagram stories, and tag me at Love Your People Well.